The Ambassador's Stickpin by Edward H. Hurlbut. The manner of Lanigan's acquiring the Ambassador's Stickpin is nearly, if not quite, as interesting as the matter of his losing it. His possession of the pin was simple enough when one understands the chromatic ways of a police reporter's daily routine, and Jack Lanigan was the star police reporter of the city. The surrender of the pin is as easily understood when one comes to learn something of the devious paths the police reporter is sometimes called on to follow, and the curious and startling situations into which they sometimes lead. Thus, when Lanigan, drifting indolently with the matinee throngs down Powell Street, stopped to hold confab with Kid Monahan, that now retired king of the pickpockets, it was natural enough that he should remark on a stickpin of odd design that replaced the accustomed three-carat in the king's silk cravat gentry who lived by their wits and other people's wealth affect stones of much size some policemen wear them too it was natural enough that the king proverbially generous noticing the glance of interest should say here wear it and with a motion as quick and as deft as a hummingbird's flit transfer the pin from his tie to that of the newspaper man it was then for lanigan to observe dryly your title is certainly earned as he extracted the pin and offered it back but this being a pin of very unusual design i am afraid i might not be able to wear it as gracefully while awaiting the possible appearance of its owner as can you further that little exhibition of refined touch you just gave excites some grave suspicions that you are back at your old tricks the one-time king knew lanigan's outspoken ways further he knew perfectly that while the police accepted his declaration since his last time out of fealty to the law he was a two-timer the police were using him or thought they were as a stool lanigan did not think so if it hadn't been for what lambroso classified as the criminal lobe i might really believe you had reformed lanagan had told him once but in view of the lynx-like quality of your ears to be all top and no bottom i am afraid the stamp of an extremely low moral resistance is indelibly upon you and monahan had only grinned then as now in his ingenuous way uncomprehending and exalted lanagan a notch or two for some minor favor in times gone past lanagan had earned and held steadfastly the king's unswerving loyalty not an insignificant asset for a police reporter jack said the king in pained sincerity i'm not passing you no chance got it down at small's was shoved for a finner and i took it out of curiosity funny sticker ain't it if anybody does make you though why of course hand it over i like my old spark better anyhow small be it said was probably the thriftiest and crookedest fence inside the county with the headquarters men on the pawnbroker detail taking orders and percentages from him as faithfully as they reported to their captain of detectives with another of those flits the king placed back in his own necktie his customary brilliant taken from his vest pocket before lanagan could offer the other pin back the second time his companion had left lanagan examined the pin critically it was a funny sticker round of gold and the size and thickness of a quarter the back was plain fitted with a patent clasp on the face was a delicate relief of two eagles heads out an eye a ruby for an iris was in the exact centre below the eye were two clasped hands and above two crossed swords woven around the entire design was what he at first took to be a snake but discovered on closer scrutiny to be a rope it was a delicate and unusual product of the goldsmith's art lanagan puzzled over it for an hour and then concluded russian from the eagles emblem of a secret order evidently from the eye the clasped hands to signify that an oath has been taken and the axe or the rope is the headman or the hangman for a breach of faith that sounds plausible but what particular society does it represent 
He placed it in his tie and was recalling what he had read about Russian secret societies when he was bumped violently by a short, swarthy individual who had, unknown to him, been following. As Lanagan straightened up, he caught a quick flash as of a message of tacit understanding in the other's eyes as he gazed straight at the pen. In another moment, a black, flat wallet, thin and oblong, had been slipped adroitly into his inside coat pocket. A word which sounded like scoria had been whispered in his ear, and the singular stranger had departed to the street to jump aboard a passing car and disappear toward the ferry. Lanagan made it a rule to be surprised at nothing, to accept nothing as coincidence not proved so, and to ignore no trifles. He was interested highly interested, and he wanted to know what Scoraria meant. That there was a connection between the pen and the wallet was to him clear. Possibly Scoraria might help him. In Fogarty's back room, hard by police headquarters, he found Petrov, Russian interpreter, in the police courts. What does a word that sounds like Scoraria mean, he asked. It means hurry, at once, or any such meaning. It is what you Americans say, get a move on, said Petrov. Sitting apart, Lanigan unfastened the black sealskin wallet and drew out a single sheet of paper, encased in a protection of oiled skin. There were written on the paper in a bold, strong hand an even dozen words, words that sent his breath whistling through his teeth. It was in English, plain, clear, and signed by a name that gave even the imperturbable Lanigan a mighty start. Undoubtedly, mused Lanigan, they either have a system believed infallible, or they are mighty reckless of state secrets, and they are not reckless. Therefore the system has slipped a cog, and I am the anointed bearer of the message of His Serene Majesty, Nicholas." I appear to be on the knees of the gods, he went on, as he wandered the streets, perplexed. It's possible, barely possible, that I am tangled in some monumental hoax, but I don't believe it. If I don't miss my guess, I will be giving the austere Mr. Sampson, damned of all men of my tribe, the biggest exclusive his sweatshop paper has turned out in this generation, but I need more coincidences. I am plainly stumped. He had stopped by Lotta's Fountain, where the traffic patrolman was endeavoring to untangle a jam of trucks and automobiles. Out of the very air, as though in weird solution to his perplexity, it came again. Scoraya! Lanigan wheeled to find the voice. He had thought he must turn directly upon the man. There was no one near him, save the occupant of a limousine, two feet away. The passenger was apparently engrossed in the evening paper. The window, though, was open. Lanigan watched him covertly from the corner of his eye. Hmm, this is getting interesting. Here am I, a live newspaper sprout, in the dead center of a bustling and workaday American city, caught as sure as the sun shines in the mysteries of a diplomatic maze between two great nations, and probably three, that is as twisted as a medieval intrigue. At this moment, the whereabouts of little me and my message are probably of as much importance as the comings and goings of the Tsar, the Mikado, or the first gentleman himself. But the next gay cat that tries any scorion on me will get the third degree right in Fogarty's back room. The limousine, the traffic jam relieved, pulled slowly ahead, but Lanigan could have sworn that the benign gentleman within, just before it did, turned fully upon him with a scrutiny of deliberate coolness. It was a casual thing, such as might have happened to anyone, but it appeared to Lanigan that there was a look of secret understanding in the other's eyes, as they dropped twice to the stick pin and returned to Lanigan's face, as though in inquiry. Lanigan took the number of the car, 89776, and then returned to headquarters. He wanted to see from the police register to whom machine 89776 belonged. When he ran through the pages to the number, the ragtime air he was whistling, very incorrectly, quickened in tempo. 89776. Owner, Boris Koshloff. 2224 Pacific Avenue, San Francisco. Aha! 
either i am hearing scoraias in my mind and either everybody that looks at me excites my suspicions or else the russian mr kozloff is a link in the very plain chain that is stretching from me and my pen to his majesty nicholas at st petersburg on one end and the president in washington at the other frankly it looks preposterous that if kozloff is on the job he would use his own machine then again what if that is the method chosen to point my path to me if this message is to someone in san francisco they must know by this time that it has gone astray barring my own coincidence in bungling into state secrets via kid monahan's touch and his taste for the really distinctive in jewelry it appears that everything is working out on a very remarkable and finished system i will pay mr kozloff a visit he has been too much of a figure of mystery in this city anyway boris kozloff a wealthy russian portrait painter had dropped into san francisco with introductions some months before he had earned a high repute for the elegance of the soirees given at his house and had figured in the public prints moreover in other ways on one occasion a burglar found prowling within the koshloff's drawing-room had been shot and killed by koshloff who thereupon was lionized to a considerable extent by the neurotic and sentimental elements of his circle he had figured again when a household servant had fallen from his second-story window receiving frightful injuries although during his raving in delirium the servant had cried frequently spare me spare me and had led some cynical reporters on the hospital beat to suspect foul play nothing was ever proved in face of koshloff's explanation that the servant fell in cleaning windows after the man recovered sufficiently he was removed by koshloff to a private hospital and there he passed from the scope of the news-gatherers and hence from public attention now it might be well to say here and before the reader is too far carried away by the story that the curious chronicles of the happenings about to be recorded must rest for all time for their authentication in five quarters the russian government the american department of state jack lanagan king monahan and myself it is not probable that either the russian or american governments would affirm the truth of the facts recorded as for the rest the extraordinary series of complications following the receipt of the stick pin the use of such a device as the stick pin as the connecting link in a grave international crisis the use of the personal courier rather than cipher code they must all be accepted on my word the word of lanagan or the word of king monahan who first received the pin to such as are unwilling to accept that proof the story must be read solely as a bit of fiction lanagan strolled back to the inquirer i had just finished several yards of real estate junk for the business office and was as grouchy as the brother of the tribe always is when assigned to do business office write-ups fine line for an able-bodied reporter said lanagan cynically looking over my shoulder turn that rod in and come with me and be a real reporter i'll give you a story that will make the a p wires hum to the four corners of the earth provided my hunch don't go altogether wrong he spoke to samson telling him that there was a bare chance of something turning up on the russo-japanese situation and asked for me to be detailed to accompany him good replied samson get after it we haven't broken a story on that yet the eastern papers are having a lot of stuff on the secretary of state though he has dropped out of sight the a p is bringing in a story broken by the sun that his supposed sickness was the bunk and that as a matter of fact he has been out of washington for a week supposed to be in new york on some confab with the russian ambassador who is at the waldorf astoria the ambassador denies any such conference it's a hot yarn try to turn up an end on it out here lanagan suggested supper and as we lingered over our coffee and cigars he briefly outlined the situation i read the astounding message and must confess that i was stirred to a very unprofessional pitch of excitement before taking a car for pacific avenue we dropped in at police headquarters where lanagan met chief leslie that shrewd thief-taker and they were in earnest talk for ten minutes 
in his police reporting lanagan had the superlative advantage of leslie's confidence that famous chief had indeed as high a regard for lanagan's work as for that of his own men leslie stood many a roast from the opposition papers for his habit of programming with lanagan and for turning over his men to the service of the newspaper man more than once as we rode to our destination lanagan instructed me to take a position well concealed opposite the kozloff house wait until midnight and then if he did not appear telephone to headquarters where brady and wilson two of leslie's best men would be in readiness with the police automobile we were to force the house for it is just possible said lanagan lightly that i can't escape delivering my packet if they once drop to me it may be interesting that burglar shot by kozloff takes on rather a new importance likewise that foreigner who was all broken up in an accidental fall from kozloff's second-story window i rather look forward to a run-in with this gentleman of mystery and his retinue of scoriers but don't wait after midnight brady will have a search warrant on some phony charge or other and you can tear right in we parted company several blocks from the koshloff mansion it was nearing nine thirty i found a hiding place almost directly opposite slipped in and in a few moments saw lanagan walk briskly up the stairs of the russian house he was whistling a bit of ragtime as usual off key his insouciance cheered me frankly i was nervous a weakness i cannot seem to overcome i have never failed lanagan yet in a crisis and i suppose on results am as brave as he but in my own heart i know i am not possibly gifted with a little more imagination than he i can see further picture the slab on the morgue the gang in the police reporter's room chipping in for a floral piece while somebody tries to relieve the strain by saying something funny johnny o'grady or jim bradley or some of the others of the old guard delegated to the pleasant detail of carrying the news home it was always the same i always had that faculty as hamlet says of thinking too precisely on the event the door opened to lanagan's ring and he passed from my sight to be ushered along the main hall down a flight of steps through another long hall carpeted richly with niches here and there holding exquisite statuary to a billiard room panelled in richest mahogany from the conduct of his guide it was apparent that he was expected in the billiard room two smooth-shaven trim keen-eyed men were playing a desultory game surmise was bulking large within lanagan's breast he had seen that same type before secret service was stamped as indelibly upon them as his vocation is stamped upon the upper office man a light tattoo on a panelling an answering tattoo another staccato and the panel slid back and the odour of black cigars was heavy on the air as lanagan stepped into a small compartment the panel slipping noiselessly shut behind him as his guide disappeared at a table were seated two men facing him one of the two he recognized koshloff but the other lanagan looked hard there could be no mistake those features had been looming from the front pages of the papers too frequently for any mistake lanagan stood without speaking but before his mind's eye was dancing the front page of to-morrow's inquirer he would lay a seven-column lead across that page that would carry around the world it was kozloff who spoke you have the packet yes would you present it then in a low voice to the other as lanagan calmly placed the sealskin wallet upon the table kozloff murmured assuredly my superiors must know their business but i cannot comprehend the disappearance of carlos and the transfer of the pin and packet to the stranger it must be in order however our system has never failed he turned a shrewd gaze upon lanagan studying him intently when do you return he asked finally just as soon as i am permitted to replied lanagan with perfect truth strange muttered kozloff in the other's ear peculiar it is the answer we have no choice it must be in order without more ado the packet was opened and kozloff presented the slip in silence to his companion 
that man of massive intellectual forehead and deep-set penetrating eyes scanned it carefully and pondered long koshloff watching him with half-closed but eager eyes tell your imperial master said the other turning sharply upon lanagan and speaking with clean incisiveness that you met the secretary of state in person and that the secretary speaking for his excellency the president says that the answer of the president is yes the secretary of state ten days disappeared from washington out here on the western fringe of the continent pledging the attitude of the united states in the threatened russo-japanese conflict and not a line in any paper in the world to indicate the whereabouts of the secretary his business or the definite attitude of the united states in the impending conflict it was the story of a newspaper man's lifetime carry the verbal message or transmit it to your relief instructed koshloff conditions may not make packets safe by the time you reach the orient you may go you have funds your pin is safe i have said lanagan who with two days to go to payday had about sixty-five cents he indicated the pin with a gesture and turned on his heel for the panel to be stopped by a sudden muffled uproar from the billiard room a sound of excited shrill cries of scuffling neither the secretary nor koshloff moved a muscle neither did lanagan he was thoroughly in possession of himself two panels swiftly and noiselessly slid open at the farther wall of the room and two smooth-shaven trim keen-eyed men stepped into the room alertly and took their places beside the secretary's chair mr secretary travels with the entire secret service bureau lanagan found time to comment to himself there came a tattoo on the panel from the billiard room the secretary held up his hand for silence and motioned one of the secret service agents who stepped noiselessly to the panel and listened the tapping came again answer commanded the secretary it is over whatever it was the panel slid open through the aperture came one of the billiard players, flashing a quick, steely glance upon Lanagan. Balked by the eternal, shot through Lanagan's mind, the owner of that pin has shown up. It's now or never. He stepped casually to the panel. It was a fine chance. Once through there, he could make a fight for the front door, and the seven-column exclusive in the Inquirer. Directly before him, fairly filling the space of the panel, was the other billiard player, it was quick action. Lanagan shot out his right for the man's jaw, but his arm got about halfway. A grip like an iron clamp had him just above the elbow. He was whirled face about, a secret service man on either side. As though nothing had happened, the man who had first entered through the panel door spoke. There is a person outside, somewhat excited, who wishes to speak to Mr. Koshloff. He said to say it was Carlos koshloff leaped for the doorway and in a moment more had dragged fairly by the hair of his head a wild-eyed dark-visaged person who when he straightened up perceived the pin in lanagan's tie and made a tigerish spring for him a dirk gleaming in a half arc as he leaped but the right fist of one of the secret agents met him en route and the frenzied carlos was disarmed he staggered to his feet striving vainly to get at lanagan thief robber death to him death to him who dares rob the messenger of his imperial majesty nicholas the gentleman appears to be teething remarked lanagan koshloff pressed a button and two swart giants appeared he indicated carlos with a nod he wore the pin but he has failed in his obligation he must receive discipline the miserable wretch fell to his knees with upraised hands supplicating oh no sire my wife my babies ten minutes too late or i would have had it back and this sneak thief's life but koshloff frowned impatiently and in a second more carlos was whisked away a weird scream floating back wearily from some hidden corridor to indicate the terror that gripped him there was something in that scream of fear of more than the knout as it rang through lanagan's ear he recalled the crossed axes and the hangman's noose of the pen. It was clear enough. There would be another burglar killed. He whirled upon Koshloff. Professor Koshloff, or whoever or whatever you are, 
he said in a tone of deadly acidity that man is turned up out of here unharmed by so much as a scratch or i'll have you snaked into the city prison within twenty-four hours and some other very general suspicions will incidentally be given an airing you may be the right eye or the right hand of his serene majesty nicholas but i'm jack lanagan of the san francisco inquirer and in my own particular bailiwick something of a czar myself you're a long way from russia right now you're in little old san francisco do you get me the cat-like quality of lanagan's eyes to glow under the stress of anger or great excitement exhibited itself his face in anger was not what was calculated to put infants to slumber he had forgotten the secretary for the moment the agents had all withdrawn he was recalled to him when that person taking his cigar from his teeth and gazing upon its ash contemplatively said in even tones i think possibly you are unduly exercising yourself something of a czar the smooth voice went on indeed and it is a pleasure to meet the czar of the bailiwick of san francisco and the secretary bowed profoundly and gravely now let us talk business mr lanagan as for carlos his case is absolutely ex-territorial so far as we are concerned please inform me how you came by that packet and pen eavesdropping in matters of state do you young men of the press hold nothing sacred not your country's peace or the peace of other nations so far as that goes retorted lanagan coolly and not condescending to take note of your eavesdropping we young men of the press have a duty to our papers which our papers in turn owe to the people in this case it is a clear duty by what right do you or any other man president or not arrogate to yourself the power to hold this secret caucus resting your country's stand in this grave affair entirely upon the judgment of one or two men you are the servant of the people let the whole people know where you are now and what you are doing get the sentiment of your country before you plunge into this agreement i personally most emphatically disagree with the answer you are sending back the public are as likely to think my way as yours the secretary looked bored it is not possible with this exception grimly lanagan turned for the panel and sought the spring it is ten minutes after twelve he said laconically i must leave here open the door if you please neither man moved the secretary said we have not quite covered our ground you have not answered my question the pen i received from a friend who claimed to have taken it from a pawn-shop the packet was put in my pocket by a swarthy man who met me on the street and who said scoraya so did another chap in kozlov's automobile i wanted to see the thing through that so accidentally came my way now when i came in here i did not come alone i am fully aware that nations planning wars to cost hundreds of thousands of lives would not scruple at one my friends should be breaking in here now i told them to give me until twelve o'clock so far as your man carlos is concerned i can only surmise that he was to meet a courier at the steamer but had his pen stolen from him the courier then wandered the streets seeking the pen and by happy chance tumbled against me wearing it and likewise wandering the streets the other skoraya boy i presume was one of kozlov's secret service men sent out to see that the messenger reached here safely he must have likewise picked me up on the matinee promenade by accident correctly reasoned murmured koshloff and i believe you have cleared the situation a most remarkable series of coincidences but then anything may happen in this remarkable city of yours do i go peaceably asked lanagan glancing at his watch his voice hardened a trifle it was twelve thirty after a um, bit purred koshloff and the next instant was gazing coolly into lanagan's police colt koshloff lifted his hand with an indolent gesture to push the muzzle to one side took a look into lanagan's eyes thought better of it and turned with mock deprecation to the secretary that gentleman was watching lanagan with frank admiration we've got a place for you mr lanagan he said heartily any time you care to come to washington lanagan was nettled 
here were keen quick-witted level-headed men poking quiet fun at his spectacular display because they were of the quick intuitions of the exceptional mind they fathomed his mind and knew that he would not shoot lanagan felt rather boyish for a fleeting second got himself in perspective as it were and grinned at the grotesqueness of the situation then that seven-column scarehead in the inquirer the exclusive that was to hum around the world focused before him open that door Kozlov arose then there is something singularly compelling about a blue-nosed revolver six inches from your temple regardless of any psychological conviction you may have that the man is not going to use it but whether lanagan would have carried the situation through successfully cannot be answered for at that moment there came a tapping on the panel Kozlov stopped at a signal from lanagan the tapping came again the secretary spoke the situation is becoming strained however diverting it may be to all of us for my part here are three men all presumably of minds trained to meet sudden exigencies and yet no one of us can solve this one but other matters seem to be pressing the tapping was becoming more insistent let us call a truce mr lanagan of precisely ten minutes at the end of that time i give you my word we will return matters to just their present condition it is agreeable absolutely said lanagan pocketing his revolver koshloff sprang across the room and tapped he was answered to his satisfaction for the panel slid open and after a whispered consultation with one of the secret service men koshloff stood from before the panel and i norton my hands neatly manacled behind me was ushered into the room never will i forget the look on lanagan's face for at least three seconds he was jolted out of his traditional immobility his look was mingled alarm surprise and amusement poor norrie half banteringly half serious poor old blunderbuss i have certainly got him in a fine mess him and his sick wife at home i was so glad to see that nothing had happened to him that i paid little attention to the other two for the moment i was telling him how i waited until twelve fifteen and had just determined on telephoning headquarters for brady and wilson when standing as i supposed well concealed i was suddenly pinioned by two figures that seemed to start up from the earth handcuffed and hustled across the street into the room where we now are i must compliment you on your organization said lanagan ironically bowing toward koshloff around that gentleman's bearded lips played the faintest trace of a mocking smile i could fancy how that smile ground into the proud soul of lanagan the secretary was growing impatient the ten minutes mr lanagan he queried lanagan turned and looked at me a long time you should have obeyed orders he said finally i told you to give me until twelve not twelve fifteen it was the first time in his life lanagan had ever criticized me and it cut to the quick i knew then how bitter his disappointment was what is your proposition he said turning abruptly to the secretary whom i had at once recognized as well as Kozlov i haven't any proposition mr lanagan it is simply that neither the russian government nor our government can afford to let the world power know that the secretary of state journeyed incognito across the american continent to reach a diplomatic agreement with russia don't you realize what the publication of that unprecedented thing would mean my only proposition is a declaration you hear most important information it would undoubtedly make a splendid news sensation to-morrow morning but you cannot possibly see the great dangers you would involve your country in you might as well sit on a barrel of giant powder and drop your cigar and expect to save so much as a collar button as to print that story now and avoid war my being here was absolutely a matter imperative for certain sufficient reasons it was necessary that i present myself to mr koshloff in person that is all 
i know newspaper men among the washington correspondents i number many warm friends i will take the judgment upon myself of placing you both upon your honor if i permit you to go free from here your lips are inviolately sealed for all time upon the contents of that telegram so far as i am concerned that cannot be used until such time as this trouble has been adjusted or let me say until the present administration is out of power in washington into the stillness that followed i could distinctly hear lanagan's teeth grind together those remarkable eyes of his seemed fairly to emit a stream of fire they blazed so fiercely upon koshloff and the secretary he threw a sweeping glance around the room it was a look for all the world like you see in the eyes of a caged tiger when he is aroused for my part there was a quick drop some place under my diaphragm i was thinking of my sick wife and the consequences to her of being held a state's prisoner his hand went to his pocket and he half drew his revolver but it was rather a subconscious act i think than any deliberate design to use it for government after all is a potent thing we fight for it and die for it it was a splendid and natural influence not to be lightly tossed from us and here sat one of government's highest representative lanagan's hand dropped to his side that is better said the secretary for really mr lanagan you cannot move from this room until we say the word you are as helpless as though you were shackled it is late and we have important work to do your answer it was almost pitiable to see lanagan then he of a score of brilliant newspaper victories the genius of his craft who found no situation too difficult to solve that striking figure in the newspaper life of the west who knew no duty save to his paper who embodied the best and the highest ideals that tradition gives to the gentlemen of the fourth estate was beaten the glow had left his eyes and his voice was dispirited as he said you have my word mr secretary but on one condition that carlo's life be spared and that you start him back with your answer it was no fault of his there is only one man in town who could have got that pin from him and i can hardly blame carlo's for losing it once kid monahan wanted it that condition must be granted mr koshloff said the secretary koshloff hesitated the wearer of the pin understands the penalty he began curtly i know but in this case i personally request it it is granted said koshloff definitely lanagan was morose and savage the secretary proffered cigars which lanagan impatiently refused there is one thing that i would like however he said with but faint show of graciousness and that is this pin it will not be worn i would like it as a memento as something tangible to exhibit some day when i may tell this story as proof in support of possibly one of the most unusual experiences of myself or any other newspaper man there are but two in existence said koshloff soberly this one belongs to our ambassador at washington it was sent to me for use in receiving the imperial message the other is in the possession of the czar and will be worn by the receiving courier at st petersburg the penalty attaching to the loss of the pen either to myself or my agents are well they are somewhat stringent and with the single exception of carlos have always been enforced lanagan snapped the patent clasp and handed the pen to koshloff you see if i lost it with the slightest inflection on the pronoun there would be no czar of this particular bailiwick to pardon me as you pardon carlos mr koshloff we walked the long distance back to town and dropped in at blank lanagan had not addressed a word to me i knew better than to attempt to draw him into conversation i could feel that he was working the thing over and over again in his mind he suddenly burst forth passionately i could have beaten them i could have beaten them and they didn't convince me at that that the story should not have been printed there's too much of this one man for the nation stuff in our government anyhow it was a month before lanagan told me that it was because of my wife's feeble health that he feared to take the risk of having us both bottled up for a month by manoeuvring further for freedom and had added merely another argument to prove that your true reporter should not marry 
and as if to justify the truth of lanagan's assertion to me that the story should have been printed within three days the japanese fleet scorpion-like had struck and crippled that unsuspecting and unready russian flotilla yeah flanagan had cried to me in furious disgust as he ripped the front page of the inquirer with his seven-column warhead to tatters statesmen diplomats give me one live reporter and i'll teach the whole gang of them the right way do you suppose for one single solitary coruscating second that if those japs knew the secretary was hobnobbing with the russian envoy right here in san francisco that the blow would have been struck well i tell you no i wouldn't even have had to print the message the story of the meeting was enough well the time limit set by the secretary has long since expired so here is the suppressed story of the ambassador's stick pin the finest biggest cleanest in its elements of any of his whole career as lanagan mourned to me more than once end of the ambassador's stick pin <laughs>